Good evening, everyone, and uh, good evening, Dr. Shashank Shah. Today, Shashank Shah, uh, first of all, a little amendment in the uh, in the title of his talk. Uh, I wrote by mistake, economic challenges beyond COVID. Actually, it's not only economic, it says challenges beyond, beyond COVID. So there are lots of challenges which he will take up. As you can see, uh, he's a young man with an excellent uh, track record. And if you see his profile, which is published in the bulletin today, you can see that he's a he's on a great path. He's written some books, which are famous amongst them: uh, Soulful Corporations, Win Win Corporation, and the Tata Group. He calls himself a jignasu, someone who has a quest for knowledge, both of the outside world and inside. I don't want to take much time because we've already overshot the uh, business time, and uh, I would like to hand over to. Shashank straight away so that we have more time for him and uh, for questions which you may have from him after the talk. So, so over to uh, Shashank. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Chitnis Ji, and thank you also to Surendra Bhai uh, for the opportunity for inviting me to address uh, eminent Rotarians of the Rotary Club of Pune Central. Uh, this is the first of its kind uh, interaction with your institution. And uh, thanks to Chitnis Ji for correcting the title. I had said that it would be challenges beyond COVID because I wanted to raise some pertinent issues, which I think this is the best platform to discuss because having the motto of service above self, uh, the Rotary Club and the Rotarians are the most appropriate audience uh, to share these insights. Uh, since most of you have been working professionals, entrepreneurs, uh, public servants in, in some of the most eminent positions in the government of India, and individuals who have decision-making capacity, uh, these observations would be quite an eye-opener. Uh, so I'd, uh, I'd provide a background and a context to why I'm saying what I'm saying. Uh, and thereafter, I'd be sharing lots of fact files, details, and anecdotes so that you'll be able to appreciate a context because you all undertake so many service activities uh, with thousands and thousands of Rotary Clubs across the globe. Uh, I'm sure the quantum of uh, service that you all do is uh, quite uh, phenomenal. And hence, uh, some of the things that I'd be sharing as challenges would be important for uh, important pieces of information which would be useful in further planning some of the activities or initiatives. Uh, so let me go back uh, 50 years. Uh, it was the 13th of September, uh, Milton Friedman eventually won the Nobel Prize. He wrote a celebrated article in the New York Times. Uh, and the title of the article uh, was, The Business of Business is Business. Uh, most of the things that I'll be sharing will be in the context of business uh, because my uh, higher education, my PhD, everything is in the field of business management, but I'd be providing a context to it again. So Milton Friedman said this famous statement, the business of business is business. And a colleague of my late uh, maternal grandfather, Professor C. H. Shah at the Chicago School of Economics, uh, interestingly, Milton Friedman had also visited our home uh, in Mumbai uh, 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 to, see, to meet my grandfather, who was a professor at the Mumbai University uh, for almost 30 years. But uh, I, I differ with him uh, substantially with his approach to business uh, as he has described it. But over the next three years, from 1970 till late 1990s, this shareholder primacy became the mantra in corporate America and had inspired developing economies across the globe to follow a similar trajectory. Uh, interestingly, the Business Roundtable, which is an influential association of leading CEOs of American corporations in 1997, had uh, given as a purpose of the corporation and I'd like to quote them. They said, the paramount duty of management and of board of directors is to the corporation's stockholders. The interests of other stakeholders are relevant as a derivative of the duty to stockholders. This is what they said in 1997. But 22 years later, just last year in 2019, the business roundtable announced a new purpose for the corporation. And they literally tossed this old purpose of the corporation in the dustbin. Interestingly, this new purpose of the corporation was a 300 word long purpose. And the word shareholders weren't mentioned till the word, till the 250th word. So what caused this change in heart? 
why did corporations need a new purpose for themselves? Uh, since, since mid 2000s, uh, people have been asking fundamental questions about how well capitalism has served the society. If we notice majority of the nations in the world today have espoused some form of capitalism or another. In 2008, uh, when Bill Gates was addressing uh, the, uh, the World Economic Forum at Davos, that was his last year as the chairman of Microsoft, he spoke of what he called creative capitalism. In 2011, uh, Professor Michael Porter, uh, my former colleague, when I was a visiting scholar at the Harvard Business School, spoke of shared value creation, which is quite a celebrated uh, concept in corporate circles today. In 2013, John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, which has now been acquired by Amazon, and Raj Sisodia, an eminent professor from the Babson College, wrote about what is now called as conscious capitalism. Was it an oxymoron? How can conscious and capitalism go together? Wasn't capitalism all about exploiting people and planet for profits? And then came more terms in the subsequent decades, compassionate capitalism, inclusive capitalism, sustaining capitalism. It was as if there was a dire need of an adjective before the word capitalism to justify its existence as an approach to the way economies are functioning. Or had we not understood the way capitalism was originally envisaged by its founding fathers nearly 250 years ago? Why was or why is capitalism, capitalism in need for a major changeover? And why is it being reflected all over the globe today in such substantial measure? I think one of the primary reasons for that is that the challenges that the people and the planet are facing today are so enormous that if they are not addressed urgently, we will not as a human race enter the 22nd century. While we are planning some very fascinating worldviews as to how the world would appear in the 22nd century, the reality is far different from that. Uh, most of the discourse today is around the current pandemic. Uh, I heard a lot of conversations when I joined at about 620 about how uh, the pandemic, the number of deaths, the healthcare concerns, the vaccine, with nearly 9 lakh lives lost, it is one of the most unprecedented healthcare catastrophes of modern times. But it is not one of its kind. The new normal that all of us are talking about isn't just about adjusting in a post-COVID world with respect to a single virus. I see the entire conversation today in newspapers, in the media, in conversations within institutions, all about COVID, COVID, and COVID alone. But the problems and challenges are many more, and that's why I've titled my presentation today as Challenges Beyond COVID. What are the challenges beyond COVID? Beyond COVID does not mean after COVID or after the vaccination and the inoculations are over. No, I meant beyond the con problem that COVID is posing. What are the other challenges? Are there any major challenges facing the world? Or are we going to be fine once the vaccine comes and we've kind of defeated COVID and life is again normal. And that's what we are calling the new normal, wherein we may have to make some changes, but life will be fine. We'll all be able to uh, enjoy khana, pina, sona. We'll be back to the way it was pre-COVID. I think there are several, several challenges, and I'm going to highlight seven of them with some very interesting fact files, uh, which, which have influenced my research, and which is what I feel are important markers for decision makers, for civil society, for corporations, for policy makers, for government and decision makers to look at in all seriousness. Because it is only when we, as individuals and institutions, companies and countries, recalibrate the way we are living our lives and take decisions in the future, will we collectively be able to enter the 22nd century. So let me start and talk about the seven severe challenges that are facing the entire globe, and I'd be sharing how India also is not spared by them. The number one challenge, which is why capitalism has kind of woken up to a need to its redefinition, is income inequalities and poverty. It's the number one cause haunting the world today. 
and it is the number one topic that impacts most elections in established democracies of the world. Uh, an interesting fact file, around 2015, of the 100 largest economies in the world, 51 were companies and only 49 were countries. I repeat, 51 were companies and 49 were countries. Fast forward to 2019, 72 are companies and 28 are countries. So among the largest economies in the world today, we are having more companies than countries in that list. As per Jan 2020, at a 1.3 trillion market cap, the uh, Apple Incorporated was larger than the economies of Mexico, Indonesia, Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, and Switzerland. That's the kind of power corporations hold today. But this hasn't been a sudden development. In 1999, the richest 1% of people in the world received as much as 57% of the people at the base of the pyramid. A decade later, in 2010, the GDP of the poorest 48 nations in the world, which is about a quarter of the world's population, was less than the wealth of the world's three richest people. Fast forward to 2020, in US alone, the top 1% of the population owns 90% of the wealth of the country. And India is not far behind. In India, the top 10% of the population, according to a Credit Suisse report, owns nearly 80% of the wealth. And the bottom 60% owns just 5% of the wealth. According to one interesting statistic, the wealth of 16 richest Indians is equal to the wealth of 60 crore Indians. I repeat, the wealth of 16 richest Indians is equal to the wealth of 60 crore Indians. And this is in 2020. And another interesting fact file, because so much of service happens, the average daily household income of a farmer in 17 states across India is 55 rupees for a family of five. That is just 11 rupees per person per day. This is despite 30, 30 years of economic liberalization for India. It is no surprise that with such glaring disparities, while we are extremely happy, and I'm not trying to portray a gloomy picture, but because we are so happy about the success of India and the growth and all that we are doing as a nation and as a civilization, and also as a global family, there is a need to highlight some of these things for the path ahead. So though India is among the top three economies in the world by purchasing power parity and the top five in terms of nominal GDP, we are 126th in the world in terms of per capita GDP. That's the kind of disparity because of the difference between the concentration of wealth with the rich vis-a-vis -vis the poor. In such a scenario, can businesses continue to look at their existential purpose as making profits alone? Or is there a need to look at businesses and take decisions, keeping the socio-economic empowerment of the people at various levels of the economic pyramid? The second severe challenge which we are facing, voracious consumption, which is leading to food crisis and hunger. As per one study, if the entire world consumes the way America does, we will need not one, but four Earths to fulfill our consumption requirements. And this is in a scenario when one in nine people in the world, one in nine people habitually go hungry and as a result are victim to nutritional deficiencies. Food security is the biggest threat to overall health of the human population more than malaria, TB, or even COVID. As simple thing as food security. But we have dichotomies. Even though approximately 11% of the world is undernourished, about 40% of the adult population in the world is overweight. So there are problems of another kind in the developed economies. In India, we have another problem. 30% of the Indian children, three in every 10, suffered due to 
malnutrition. And the number of undernourished citizens across the globe has continued to be high over the last two decades, despite all the advances that we've made in technology and its applications across all domains, including phenomenal global supply chains, logistics, and distribution networks, which means that these benefits have not reached the population at the base of the pyramid in the substantial measure it was meant to be, whether it is the developing, the developed, or the underdeveloped economies. More so, the disparities are very stark. Can development initiatives continue to bypass the poor? Can corporations focus on making money at the cost of a huge proportion of their prospective customer population not having the basic access to good food and existential requirements. Severe challenge number three, water shortages. It is a dim scenario in the present and a grim scenario in the future. It's a very popular saying, but I will repeat it, that it has been predicted and not now since the last 20 years. When I was in school, I, was, I used to hear that. And it's an increasingly true fact that if there is a world war fought in the future, it will be over water. Around mid 2000s, that's about 15 years ago, a BBC report had indicated that about 40% of the world's population was facing serious water shortage. And people in rich countries were using 10 times more water than those in the poor ones. How many of the middle-class families in India do not aspire to have those beautiful bathtubs and jacuzzis that are advertised on uh, uh, Hollywood films and Bollywood films, which talk about such luxurious water. But the fact of the matter is that in 2019, according to a World Health Report, World Health Organization and UNICEF report, 220 crore people in the world, which is almost one third of the population, lacked access to safely managed drinking water services. And 15 years since the BBC report, per capita water consumption in the developed countries continued to be six times more than the underdeveloped countries. In most parts of India, the per capita availability of water is one bucket full, which is used for everything with respect to the personal requirements. I'm reminded here of that vivid advertisement of Hindustan Unilever. Uh, I'm sure most of you would have seen it. In that advertisement, uh, there is this uh, bathing cubicle that is placed in the middle of a village uh, by a group of people. And there is a beautiful shower on the top. And a particular uh, uh, inquisitive kid from the village comes inside that cubicle. And when he comes inside the cubicle and opens the tap, the water starts coming from the shower. As the water is falling from the shower, his first reaction is he cups his hands and starts drinking that water. And in the next half an hour, the entire village lines up outside that bathing cubicle and turn by turn, they are cupping their hands, drinking water, and they have got some pots to collect that water so then they can take it back home for their drinking requirements. And the very poignant message at the end of that advertisement is, in half an hour, the drinking water requirements of the entire village have been satisfied. And yet, one urban gentleman's bath on a Sunday evening, on a Sunday afternoon, is still not over. A very powerful message, a very, very poignant reality, which we are all uh, aware of. Uh, the other important part connected with water is lack of sanitation. According to a 2019 uh, WHO and UNICEF report, nearly 420 crore people, which is half the world's population, lack safe access to sanitation services. In India, we've had so much of halubulu about the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, but the fact is that 50 crore people have been removed from this list of people who have access to safe sanitation services because of the efforts made in the last six years. However, the challenge and problem of behavioral change still remains in order to make this successful. Uh, with respect to India, I'd like to say that with 18% of the global population, India has access to only 4% of water resources, only 4%. And 
16 crore people in India, which is about 12% of the population, lack access to safe drinking water. Uh, maybe for that reason, the current government has assured that by 2024, when they complete their term, this 16 crore people will have access to tap drinking water. I'm not mentioning here about the 50 crore people in different parts of India who alternatively face drought and floods at some time of the year or the other. And it's very important to note here that we have these farmer uh, protests uh, uh, in, in the outskirts of Delhi. Uh, and a very important fact which was mentioned, and, and this has never come up in the conversation, but a very important fact that was mentioned in many reports was that the farmers from Punjab have been disproportionately growing wheat and rice because they have a high minimum support price. But wheat and rice are the maximum water guzzling crops. And the consumption is far, and the production is far more than the consumption across India. And as a result, we have tons and tons of them lying idle in the godowns of the Food Corporation of India being consumed by rats. On the other side, the farmers are not willing to take up the production of important cereals like pulses, which are very important in a high proportion vegetarian country in India for the consumption of proteins. And you may be surprised to know that annually, Indian government spends 24,000 crore rupees just to import pulses in India, though India is already the the, having the largest uh, pulse acreage in the world, but our production per acre is among the lowest in the world. And there are countries like Canada and Australia that are growing pulses only to export to India. Nobody in Canada or Australia consumes those pulses. So that is the kind of scenario we are facing with respect to water. These discussions also do not emerge in our conversations when we talk about the latest scenario. Severe challenge number four, public health. This discourse around COVID was primarily about life versus livelihood. Whether life is important or livelihoods are important. In a country as large as India and in metro cities as large as Mumbai, with among the highest density populations in the world, life and livelihood are equally important because if I do not get money, I will not be able to survive and feed my family. As I just mentioned, per day earning per family is 11 rupees. I'm sorry, per day earning per person is about 11 rupees. And yet public health remains a very important cause of concern across the world. At least half of the world, 750 crore people are not receiving the public services that they need. And almost 10 crore people are pushed into extreme poverty because they have to pay for health services out of their own pockets. In a country like America, one of the biggest discussions during the recent presidential election was about the affordable health care, which was popularly called Obama care, whether it will be there or it will not be there even in among the most developed countries of the world and the number one in terms of the GDP, still the conversation about investments in public health and whose responsibility it is to take care of those at the base of the pyramid is a big question mark, which means investments in public health still remain a peripheral priority. In India, let me share this because of the overwhelming focus on COVID, which is definitely unprecedented. I'm not trying to... Uh, 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 try to dilute its seriousness, but I'd like to highlight some. Uh, like to highlight some other facts. For example, one fourth of the global TB cases occur in India, causing four lakh twenty five thousand deaths per year. Four lakh twenty five thousand deaths per year due to TB. We've had nine lakh COVID deaths across the globe. Four lakh twenty five thousand TB deaths in India alone per year. And another statistic says that in the last 15 years, which includes both the Congress and the current governments, one crore people have died in India due to TB, malaria, and cancer. Three diseases have contributed to one crore deaths, but there have been no substantial investments either at the private sector level or at the public sector level to target and address this in any serious measure. Even now, the cancer grid that is happening, Pan India, is happening through the initiative of companies like the Tatas and their trusts, 
which are helping set up cancer grid across India on the model of the Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. And yet we have not risen up to the requirements for substantial public health investment, infrastructure investment. According to the World Bank database, in 2017, India was the 13th lowest country in terms of the percentage of the total government expenditure that went into healthcare. That is about, India spends about 3.4% of its GDP on health related investments. For comparison, the developed economies, the high income countries, the Scandinavian countries, the Western European countries, Average, on an average spend 18.6% of their GDP on health. And the middle income countries spend about 5% of GDP. So we are one and a half percent less even than the middle income countries which have smaller populations. India is heading to becoming the country with the largest population. At the other end, we see Japan, which spends 24% of the government's budget on health care. So that is the kind of wide divide that we are seeing. The kind of investments the government has made in addressing the issues connected with COVID is equivalent to nearly 20 years of the government's healthcare budget, central government's healthcare budget. That's the kind of disproportionate focus the current disease has got because of the lack of existing investments in public health infrastructure at the rural and the urban levels. The fifth severe challenge, population explosion. We stopped discussing population in India. It was a matter of uh, great discussion uh, in the 70s, 80s. On emergency time, it was one of the big decisions uh, taken under uh, Sanjay Gandhi and Shrimati Indira Gandhi. And uh, ever since the negative uh, experience connected with some aggressive population control measures has led to this uh, discussion going on the uh, uh, back burner. However, the issue still persists, not only in India, but at a global level. And I'd like to draw your attention again with some facts. In 1950, only three of the world's largest countries, only three of the world's most popular countries were from the developing world, which were they, India, Indonesia, and Brazil. By the year 2000, seven of the 10 were from developing economies. And the other three which were developed were US, Russia, and Japan. Other than that, all others were from the developing economies. As per the estimates, by 2050, there'll be only one developed nation among the top 10 most populous countries, which is America. All the remaining nine will be developing or underdeveloped economies, which means the proportion of population these economies has gone to such large levels, and yet their economic progress hasn't been as at par with that. As a result, there are so many social sector issues which most of those countries are facing and will continue to face. In India, by 2025, we'll have the distinction of becoming the world's most populous country with seven mega cities, megapolises, having a population of more than one crore each and 400 towns, which will have a population of more than 10 lakhs each. These together, will contribute to nearly 50% of India's population. And India and China will together constitute 37% of the world population. So just this part of the world is contributing to nearly more than one third of the world's population. Interestingly, by 2050, the global population will be 970 crores. And by 2100, it is likely to rise to about 1,100 crores crores. Uh, since we are not together, we are online, otherwise I'd asked you, I would have asked you a quiz question. What is going to be the population of Delhi and Mumbai in the year 2100s? Any guesses? Anybody would like to take a wild guess? Okay, I'll, I'll continue. Uh, uh, in 2100, the population of Delhi and Mumbai is going to be between 6.25 to 6.75 crores each, which means from the current two, two and a half crores, the population will be increasing three times in the next 80 years. And the pollution, the traffic, the drainage, the water, and all other problems 
when population increases three times with the current land area remaining same there is no other way to grow except going higher but the most popular populated city in the world is not going to be in the developed world it's going to be in the developing world it's going to be nigeria the capital of nigeria lagos will have a population of 8.8 crores people that's the kind of impact the rising population levels are going to have in all of these countries and what is the direct impact of population it's a severe challenge what is the direct impact one study shows that between the 1970s and 80s in those 20 25 years 79% of the tropical deforestation occurred only due to population leading to enormous elimination of species another problem is food production not vegetarian food production but non vegetarian food production because feeding a large population requires increase in larger livestock numbers and raising animals for food consumption consume more than half of all the water consumed in the usa one study shows that it takes 2500 gallons of water to produce a pound of meat especially beef but takes only 25 gallons of water to produce a pound of wheat so the meat industry is directly or indirectly responsible for 80% of all the soil erosion that's happened in a developed country like usa and yet agriculture and agri related innovation and investment remain among the lowest corporate and governmental priorities in india alone though 50% of the population is directly or indirectly engaged in the agricultural sector agriculture contributes to only about 18% of india's gdp though this number of 50% of the population has remained more or less stagnant which means that though the population has increased 50% has still remained in agriculture and despite all the technological advancements agriculture has not been able to contribute more than 18 15 to 18% to the gdp the sixth severe challenge and i have just one more demographic concerns we think that it is limited to a certain category of people of a certain age group no no one is going to be spared by 2030 nearly 16 crore children across the world will be living in extreme poverty 5.2 crore children under the age of 5 will die due to poverty and extreme hunger in the next 10 years more than 15 crore additional girls will marry before the age of 18 by 2030 over 1000 crimes per day are committed against women in india alone and if we talk about justice 3 crore cases are pending in the indian courts for all the senior citizens some interesting fact five by 2050 one in six people in the world will be over the age of 65 compared to one in 11 currently which means 16% of the world population will be above the age of 65 currently only 9% of the population is so that tells you the need for geriatric services the need for greater investments for public health services for the senior citizens and the number of person aged 80 years or over is projected to triple from 14 crores in 2020 to nearly 42 crores in 2050 so we are talking about extended life spans and these are going to bring extended challenges because at that age with the joint family system breaking down with the nuclear families becoming increasingly popular and the lack of investment in geriatric healthcare these are going to be leading to further severe challenges and the last which is very popular well known global warming which is consuming the globe itself the most developed country in the world america the recent four years had been consistently denying the the impact of global warming and saying that it's a hoax but research has shown according to nasa typically in the last 5000 years the global temperature has increased just about 4 to 7 degrees but in the last 100 years the earth's temperature has increased by 1 degree celsius which is 10 times faster than the average rate 1 degree increases over 1000 years we have increased in 1 year in in 100 years and the 10 most hottest recorded years 
in human history have been the one between 1998 and 2018. That's the kind of heat the world is facing. But global warming is not a problem at the macro level. We are seeing it happen every day. The floods in Hyderabad, the torrential rains in Madras and now in Kerala, the uh, cloud burst in the Himalayas. Every part of the country is facing the impact of global warming. We need to wear sweaters now in Mumbai in the month of December and January, which was never the case. Monsoons have extended from June to all the way till October till the Diwali season, which was never. Global warming is not a distant reality. And the melting of the ice at the poles, the Arctic and Antarctic, is going is already happening at such a pace that countries like Maldives, Kiribati, and the Strait Islands may not even be existent 50 years later because the waters and the oceans of the world would have increased to that extent. Another interesting area, and it's connected with global warming and pollution, is about garbage. According to a study published in the scientific reports, there is this entire mass known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is about 16 lakh square kilometers in size, three times the size of France that is floating in the Pacific Ocean. Three times the size of France as a country is this garbage patch, which is never going to degenerate, never going to disintegrate. That's the kind of uh, pollution that has been let out into the water bodies. In India alone, of the total quantity of plastic that is generated annually, 40% remains uncollected. 6.2 crore tons of waste is generated in India per year, of which only 20% of urban India's waste is processed, which means 80% or 5 crore tons of waste is not even processed on an annual basis. That's the kind of problem we are facing in India. Something even more scary, in 2019, when 8% of the Amazon forests were burning, 23 lakh animals died helplessly in those forests, besides unimaginable loss to biodiversity. And I was really shaken up earlier this year when I heard that the bushfires in Australia caused the death of a hundred crore animals, equivalent to almost India's population, that many animals have been killed in the bushfires in Australia. So global warming is not a distant dream, a, a distant nightmare. It is a reality and it is impacted by the decisions that people like you and me take. A small example, the planned obsolescence strategy of the mobile and the automobile companies have wreaked havoc on the environment. We take the example of the mobile industry, and I myself did this study. If we take the consumption of mobile phones in America, India, and China, just the three top most populated countries, and presume that one in every three person replaces his mobile phone annually, one in every three replaces his mobile phone annually, by the year 2100, we will have 8,000 crore cell phones piled up with that e-waste never getting disintegrated, at least not for the next several thousands of years, several millennia. And yet we change our mobile phones more frequently than once in three years. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that these are the real challenges that, uh, that we are going to face beyond COVID. COVID has a solution. The solution is being worked out. The whole world is working together to get the vaccine ready, whether it's Pfizer or Bharat Biotech or our very own Pune based company. That problem will get solved in a year or two. We'll, we'll get back to the normalcy. But if these problems are not solved, if these problems are not even prioritized, the future generations may not even have a planet to live in. And unfortunately, we're not looking at the advice that has been given to us over the last 2,500 years. From Chanakya to Aristotle to Adam Smith, all have suggested that economic and societal well-being have to be balanced and go hand in hand. And that is why capitalism today is struggling to remain relevant because it has not lived by the 
principles, original principles with which it was envisaged by the father of modern economics, Adam Smith, 250 years ago, where he first spoke about the theory of moral sentiments and then spoke about the wealth of nations. 15 years apart, two landmark works, we grabbed up the wealth of nations and the theory of moral sentiments, which talks about moral, ethical, and societal underpinnings as a prerequisite to creating wealth has been shoved. It's no longer a priority. It was never a priority. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that companies and economies need to transition from the antagonistic paradigm of business versus society to the synergistic paradigm of business and society to the enlightened paradigm of business for society. Discussions at the World Economic Forum's Golden Jubilee on stakeholder capitalism or the top 200 CEOs of American corporations talking about a new purpose of the corporation are the right steps, but only baby steps in that direction. A lot more needs to be done. Chitnis Ji mentioned about my work. Over the last 15 years, my work primarily has been in the area of uh, stakeholder capitalism, which talks about the purpose of corporations and collectively through that, the purpose of industries and economies is not to create wealth alone. It is to create value for multiple stakeholders, customers, employees, supply chain, environment, the local community and society. All of them, when we create value for them, will we be able to truly create sustainable success and growth for the company, for the industries, for the world? that will give sustainable growth and success. I have called this the win-win strategy. My second book, Win-Win Corporations, presents studies of six companies and how they achieved it. And of course, my latest book, which is now a national bestseller, is on the Tata Group, which talks about how they have done in their own capacity over 150 years, similar things. Can we shift the focus to discussing how we can continue to do this more innovatively? I've tried to share that through my YouTube channel, where I have short videos on several aspects which I've covered today and examples of companies that have done this successfully. And I also share my thoughts through blogs on LinkedIn. So uh, please feel free to visit my YouTube channel on Dr. Shashanksha, my LinkedIn handle as Dr. Shashanksha, and of course, a lot more information on my uh, website. All of that has been shared with Chitnisji, which I believe he's forwarded to all of you. So thank you very much for your time and for this opportunity to share my thoughts and concerns. The future can be wonderful. Let us make it wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, since we've overshot our extension also, uh, we can take probably one question. Vimal, can you see the question? Yeah, I think it will be better if you choose one of them. Can you see the questions? Uh, you want me to choose? Yeah, you just choose yeah, one. You can yeah. choose one of them, any one of them. Yeah, because we... So I'll have to read all of them to choose one of them. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think uh, one of the conversations is uh, about, uh, one minute, despite all. About the game and all, was that okay? So, okay, correct. So, it's a comment on uh, Harvard and it's also a comment uh, on the politics. So, I'll cover both in brief. I think, uh, oh. yes, a very valid point. In fact, Harvard is called the Citadel of Capitalism and they are a part of the problem as well. And I think it's for that reason that uh, a lot of research and a lot of, uh, in fact, uh, the Dean of Harvard College himself had authored a book on uh, the problems with business school education itself. I would say the fundamental problem is neither with politics or with the, uh, or, uh, or with the developed or underdeveloped economies. The problem is with the system of education itself and how business schools provide that education. Uh, Professor Rakesh Khurana was the Dean of Harvard College he had written this book almost uh, five to seven years back about the devolution of business schools in the world today. We think the business schools have evolved with all these online classes, ed tech. I was recently approached by LinkedIn to write a piece on the potential of the ed tech industry in the $90 billion uh, education market of India, etc. The whole focus has been on how we can 
uh, make the most of the education sector but the purpose for which the business schools were started the title of his book is from higher aims to hired hands the whole object of business school was meant to make corporations have professionally qualified individuals so that they can fuel the growth engines of the economy but also contribute to the well being society in holistic manner today unfortunately the placement uh, 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 as uh, one of the business leaders had mentioned the placement sessions in leading iims uh, represent the cattle fairs at pushkar you give a price and the cattle is yours you give a price and the best candidate is yours so the whole mindset with which education is being imparted in the business schools the university education system itself needs to be go it needs to be overhauled in a substantial measure i think that is what will solve the problem whether it is harvard or it is dharwad the problem is same in harvard the problem is much bigger than it can be in dharwad but the problem is similar i think the problem with politics as it has been mentioned is also similar our priorities is how we can get into power but our priority is not what to do when we get into power i'm glad to some extent the lens is now focused on development and if you have have indulged in developmental initiatives even to some extent the educated citizens are willing to give you an opportunity lot more of that needs to happen the discourse needs to change for that the awareness needs to increase in that context uh, i had shared some of these fact files because these are hardly a part of our discussions we usually revel in uh, satisfaction with all the good that has happened but there's lot more that needs to be done and with the rotary clubs the motto of service before self i thought some of these ideas and concerns would lead to some innovations from your side even if it is at the level of pune city thank you okay thanks you thanks uh, dr shah for uh, you know highlighting the 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 grim future that awaits us if we uh, sort of you know don't uh, do something about it in terms of the way uh, you know the whole world looks as com at companies and lump and all all the issues that that you have painted out so uh, thanks once again for coming in uh, talking to us and we all really i mean it, it has it has given us a lot of for thought for thought uh, from uh, the club we would like to give you a small certificate of appreciation we would like have done it in person but because of the current situation it will have to be electronic so thanks you thanks once again uh, dr paul and Thank you. The meeting is done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.